Hi everyone, my name is Natalie. Today I want to do my January wrap up. So I started the year off by reading They Called Us Enemy by George Take. This is a graphic memoir, which I think I've mentioned uh, last year in connection with illustrated um, nonfiction. So I actually started reading this during the sort of post Christmas days and finished it uh, the 1st of January this year. And this is basically George Take's story of growing up in the US, uh, being a, um, a person of Japanese descent and especially his experience as a Japanese American during the Second World War. I found this very powerful, I think, especially the graphic form of this book uh, really lended itself to the uh, the dichotomy of a child's um, sort of misunderstanding or uh, understating the situation and the gravity of the situation in contrast to his uh, his parents and the way that they were experiencing this situation and the unfairness and uh, injustice that they were um, experiencing that they were living through and them trying to shield uh, him and his brother uh, from the reality of uh, what they were uh, forced to do and um, how they were treated by um, fellow Americans. The story itself is uh, strong and, and powerful and I think uh, adding voices to this part of the Second World War narrative, the form that it is telling the story I think really works in, in showing the nuanced way that the war affected people. The next book I want to talk about is The Shapeless Unease, A Year of Not Sleeping by Samantha Harvey. So this book is coming out by Gro Grove Atlantic in May this year. So I read it quite a long time before its release and uh, I actually got a NetGalley version of this book uh, because I requested it for review. Uh, so this book is, I thought that it was initially going to be something like a nonfiction version of My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Tess Moshvag. It isn't really. It, they are both talking about insomnia and the, the, the experience of being sleepless and what you do when you become desperate enough for sleep and for calmness. Um, however, this book, The Shapeless Unease, isn't really about sleep or the lack of sleep. She does write about the uh, sleep as a theme in terms of uh, becoming sort of obsessed to have sleep and um, never being able to have it and especially the, the sort of the cycle of wanting it so bad and that also making it more difficult to actually get sleep uh, so it's she's also comparing that experience with anxiety sort of a, a bad spiral that is kind of difficult to to get out of for the most part the sleep the shapeless unease is um, exploring insomnia because of the way that it shapes her every feeling thought experience throughout the year that it chronicles. The timing of the book is sort of connected with the political turmoil of the contemporary times, her being sort of uh, alienated by the reality of our society and our, our political uh, climate and her feeling disconnected with other people and with the kind of world that we live in. Through that I think you get the most relatable aspect of the book. Um, the fact that she is so confused with uh, how we got to this point, how to deal with this feeling of hopelessness. I have written a full review of this and I will link that below. Uh, basically I landed on being sort of in the middle. I liked certain aspects a lot and others just didn't do much for me. Still I think this book ends on a very positive note um, about the, the feeling that we sort of have to keep on going or that we do keep on going uh, despite it all and that there's something propelling us forward. The next book I finished was The No Longer Human by Osamu Desai. This is a Japanese author that I read in connection with uh, January in Japan, which was a readathon going on um, on Instagram. I will link the um, account uh, that started this uh, below in the description. I've read this author before. I've read both his novella Schoolgirl, which I loved, and um, the Setting Sun, which I also loved, um, which is a novel. 
This one I didn't like as much as the other two, uh, but there's still the same kind of themes that I love in, in Desai's voice. This book is basically following a protagonist who acts as a clown to everyone he knows. So even his family, he puts on a mask and becomes the funny guy, uh, the one who hasn't uh, got any troubles. Most people in his uh, in his surroundings just accepts the mask, uh, accepts the, the, the external side of him as true. And there's sort of an aspect to this that he appreciates uh, the the skill of himself by actually being able to fool people but also he knows that he's a phony. The whole book is him struggling with fitting in and appearing and passing as normal. But generally this book is a very close character study of someone totally alienated by the world that they live in, by the society they live in and take part in and being sort of disgusted almost by yourself, um, by not being bra brave enough to be different, um, by being disgusted by other people that accept or um, don't see through his facade. And it's kind of a desolate um, novel because of all of these things. Um, I like those aspects to the book. I like the themes that Desai explores and I think he's a really good writer. I didn't really like the protagonist and I think that might have lessened my enjoyment of the book as a whole or, or my connection with the book as a whole. I didn't like his, in particular, his his view of women and the way that the women are characterized through his eyes um, I found particularly jarring. It's still a good book and I think it's still a book that I will get more out of with time. Um, I don't, as I said, I don't like it as much as the other two. Uh, that might change over time, who can say? Uh, I've written a full review of this as well, I will link that below. Then the next one I finished was The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. As you can probably tell, I have tabbed it a lot because I loved it. Uh, this was my first five star read of the year. This one is Didion's memoir about the death of her husband and the aftermath of that and dealing with the grief of that. Um, it is also touching on uh, her daughter Quintana's hospitalization. In uh, The Year of Magical Thinking, Didion is dealing with her grief actively, uh, m moving through her grief and taking you along with her. Um, she shares her um, internal processing and mental processing of uh, John's death. And there's so many things I loved about this book. I think generally one of the things I loved is that it's so open in contrast to her other previous books that I read. That was one of the main issues I had that I've always felt very distanced from Didion as a writer and in this book I felt like she was completely bare and just willing to show uh, not her finished result of thinking about these things, not her having finished coming up with a perfect narrative where everything was in its place, but actually actively thinking and showing you all of the steps. There's also aspects to the grief process itself that I felt uh, were particularly enlightening in her, in, in giving me sort of a sense of what it's like to go through this, this thing. Um, things like the the feeling of of knowing that someone is gone but then um, having to relive that loss with every time that a habit or something like that um, reinforces the feeling. It's not just this one-off you experience loss and then you move on but that it's a repeated feeling of loss with every moment that you realize that the, that person is gone and I think um, that was one of the the parts of her grief that I felt especially poignant. Uh, so I love this book. I have written again a full review of this and that will be linked below. And then I read uh, Tracy Chevalier's Girl with a Pearl Earring. So this is a book that I had heard about uh, several years ago. 
and I'd seen quite a few negative reviews of it so I just put it to the side as something that was not for me and moved on and then last year I read Remarkable Creatures just by I think it was available as an audiobook on Scribd and I just sort of took a whim on it and ended up loving the audiobook and the book as a whole. I finally got to uh, The Girl with the Pearl Earring which is probably her most famous one and this book is t telling the story of a young girl who is, uh, she is, she gets the job as a maid in the house of Johannes Vermeer. Uh, so she is sort of scouted by the fact that she has an eye for detail and she is able to clean in her house, her family's house, um, in a way that isn't d disturbing the things because her father is blind so she can move things. Uh, thoughtlessly she needs to put them exactly in the right place and so that that eye for detail is what gets her this job the book itself is sort of talking about her experience living in this house her tense relationship with everyone in it especially uh, the painter himself um, there's parts to this book that is talking about the painting process that I absolutely loved and that made me really want to read more art history books uh, which is something I'm definitely planning on doing soon um, but the the tension itself the way that the characters interact um, the 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 setting the sense of place there's just something about Chevalier's uh, way of writing these things that just becomes completely transportive for me. Um, and I don't think I've read anything so completely enjoyable uh, as her books in a long time. So I love this book, it was a, a lot of fun and I look forward to reading more of Chevalier's works in the near future. Um, I also really wanted to specifically highlight um, the audiobooks both this and Remarkable Creatures are narrated by Hattie Morahan and she is such a fantastic narrator. Honestly, I feel like she added so much of my enjoyment of both of these books. Uh, she just gets the voices so completely and um, I feel like I could definitely strongly differentiate between the different characters just based on her voice. So I will link uh, the audiobook version that I listened to below um, so you can check that out if you're interested. But those were all of the books that I read in January. I also briefly wanted to mention this one. It's called uh, Embroidered Stories by Britta Marakat Lapa. And this is, uh, it is a book, but it's m mainly a art book. It's just filled with photographs of this artist's uh, works of embroidery. And she is a Sami um, artist. And she is exploring Sami culture and history through the work of embroidery and I wanted to show you this because I found this completely beautiful and also fascinating and quite um, I feel like I got a sense of this heritage even just through looking at these um, works of art um, so I wanted to share it and especially because the book itself is mainly as I said um, her art pieces but the text uh, included both in the beginning of the book and at the end when they are talking about her work and her um, becoming an artist uh, her sort of her background all of the text is available both in Swedish, English and Sami so uh, if you are interested at all it is actually uh, available in an English translation within the uh, actual book it's just uh, trilingual so uh, if you're interested at all I just wanted to mention it in case um, you wanted to learn more about Sami culture then this might be uh, a book worth looking into. So those were all of the books that I read in January and I'm already off to a good start for February so that's a good sign. Uh, I would love to know what you read in, in January or if you've read any of these books I would love to know what you thought about them in the comments below. Uh, thank you very much for watching I hope you're having a fantastic day and I will talk to you soon. Bye!